Good morning. Welcome to Life Bridge. Welcome to week three of 30 Days of Change. Before we get to the content of the message today, I want to encourage you to come back next week because we have a special guest speaker that's going to be wrapping up 30 Days of Change by the name of Jason Tucker. Uh, Jason Tucker has been, up until recently, uh, one of the pastors of a large, growing, vibrant church. You've probably even heard of it uh, in Toledo called Cedar Creek Church. So he's going to be coming speaking next week. Just recently, like a month ago, uh, he and another uh, partner have decided to plant a church in Ann Arbor this coming fall. So when somebody defects from Ohio, we got to be here in Michigan to welcome them with open arms, okay? So... So uh, uh, they're gonna be com- he's going to be coming next week uh, to wrap up 30 Days of Change. He's going to be talking about probably, probably honestly the topic I was really interested in, in preaching about, but he's going to be nailing this home. Uh, he's going to be talking about changing the way that we view adversity. Because before we follow Christ, before we start reading the Bible, uh, there is just all kinds of struggles that we go through, and none of it seems to make any sense. But actually, when we really start getting into Scripture and we start putting our faith in place, we realize that, that the things we go through in this life that just flat out stink, those things, those things make sense in God's greater, bigger plan. And so if you've ever been confused about that, or maybe you're going through or have been through some stuff and you're trying to make sense of it all, really encourage you to be here uh, next weekend for that. Also, I want to plug this just one more time. We're going through 30 days of change, which means we're, we're opening the Bible. We challenge you to read the Bible every day for 30 days, go to church four weeks in a row. And uh, we, just, we just promise that there will be change. If you go to Scripture on your own, not because anybody made you do it, but on your own, you read Scripture for yourself, you are going to experience change. And, uh, and you might be thinking you missed the boat. No, you didn't miss the boat. Uh, if you will sc- subscribe now, you can start your 30 days anytime. So if this is like the first time you've even ever heard about it, you can start 30 Days of Change. Uh, just go to the lifebridgechurch.com forward slash change. You can sign up. We'll send you a daily email with scriptures. In this, in this 30 days, you'll go through the entire gospel of Luke, the book of Romans, Ephesians, uh, Galatians, 1 John. You're going to cover a lot of material. And it's kind of sometimes like drinking from a fire hose, but we promise as you read, you're going to, you're going to take this stuff in and you're going to understand so much more than you did uh, the previous 30 days. So I encourage you to sign up for that. Today, what we're doing in the weekend messages is we're talking about the, the four biggest changes. Like if we're, we're just thinking about the idea of change, we're going, what are, the, what are the biggest changes, the most important, the most necessary that God wants us to make? The first week we talked about changing, and this is the change that all other change is built on, changing our relationship with our Heavenly Father, making it what He wants it to be. And last week we talked about changing the way we approach life. Instead of just looking to the future and always saying, what am, I, what am I doing in the future and what's going to be happening in the future and where does God want me in a year or six months from now? Instead of doing that, that we would look at where God has us and that we would look at that and go, man, God's orchestrated me in this situation to do things right here and right now. Today, I want to introduce the change we want to talk about from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. It looks like this, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. That's the big change we want to talk about today. This is a huge, significant change. Because on the one hand, you have the flesh, and on the other hand, you have the Spirit of God. And these two things are moving in absolute polar opposite directions. And so when we put our faith in God and we say, yep, I'm in, I want to follow God, that's what we're saying. We're saying we're no longer going to follow the flesh, we're going to follow the Spirit. Now, I want to break that down a little bit, because sometimes that doesn't always make a lot of sense. The The word flesh is kind of an important word, and if you've been in the 30 days of change, if you've been in the book of Romans, you've picked up on that. It talks about this. Your translation might say sinful nature or carnal nature, or it might just say flesh, but it's this one simple word. It's the Greek word sarx, 
And it's not really very complicated. It's just this, this base desire that we all have. And here's what Sarks is. Our Sarks is always self-gratifying. That's what Sarks means. It is, it is that nature that we all have with inside of us that is completely self-gratifying. Now, we all have this in us. important to catch. And because it's always self-gratifying, I always refer to it, and if you've been coming to LifeBridge for a while, you know the, the sinful nature of the flesh. I refer to it as a pig because that's what it is. It is the pig that lives inside of each and every one of us. Now, I grew up on a hog farm, and when you grow up on a hog farm, we had several hundred pigs that we would farm out each year. We had several hundred pigs. And when you grow up on a hog farm like that, you learn to hate pigs because they are always interested in themselves and themselves only. They don't care about you. They don't care about each other. Here's three things. These are the three things, the nature of a hog. These are the three things that they've got inside of them. The first thing is all they care about is fulfilling their appetite. They want to eat, right? They don't care about you, and even though you've raised them since the time they were a little bit of a piglet and kept mama from laying on them and everything like that, they don't care about you at all. So you can get in a pen, and if you've got buckets of feed in your hand, they will trample you down to get that feed. They don't care because they just want to eat. I kid you not, I, I forgot to feed the pigs for a couple days one time. <laughs> Parents were out of town, they were on a long trip, and I was left home to take care of the farm and be a man, and I failed. Anyway, so actually what happened is I was putting feed in the feeder, but I forgot to open up the feeder at the bottom so that the food would flow down, it gets plugged up, and I forgot to, forgot to do that, which Dad told me like 20 times to do. Anyway, so I forgot to do that. The, the day that my parents left, there were 22 pigs in that pen. Two days later, I come in and there are 21 pigs in the pen. Because you know what they did? They, because they were hungry and had to go without food for two days, killed the smallest, weakest pig and they literally ate it. And I jumped in the pen. There were 21 pigs and parts strewn everywhere. Right? Because that's, that's the nature of of pigs. They care about eating. Secondly, a pig only cares about taking care of its immediate need. And one of the things they do, and the reason they roll around in the mud, is to stay cool. On a hot summer day, because I was sort of the youngest and the, the pee on, one of my jobs would to do is I would take the hose and I would just start spraying it. And you, know, you can spray it anywhere. Those pigs will come running. <laughs> right? Start spraying that water in there, and then they just, they fight, and they bite, and they push each other out of the way, and they want to get to that water, and then just, they just, actually, it's really super disgusting, they just start rolling around in manure and water, and just rolling around like crazy, just, <laughs> they're in hog heaven, heaven. So that's a pig, they take care of their immediate needs. And number three, they, they want to get their sexual appetite met, right, and this Maybe a little vulgar, but when you're growing up and you watch pigs, you'll see pigs try to mate with things that aren't pigs because they don't care about how they get this sexually gratified, right? They just care that they have this desire and they want to get it met. So a pig well, yeah, with other pigs and sometimes straw bales and sometimes like a, a water spigot and a fence post and a poor unsuspecting farm boy that's just bent over working on the fence. <laughs> Bad things happen to me I can't talk about. <laughs> it's actually a true story. So anyway, <laughs> they will just go after whatever they see because that's all they care about. They are just a pig that cares about self-gratification. And Paul is saying here that we have this sinful nature, this, this sarks that lives inside of us. So everybody with me, one, two, three. <laughs> When you see yourself getting ready to do something that is just carnal and your base instinct and it's going to take care of you, I want that to be in your head, right? When somebody cuts you off in traffic and the first thought in your head is to, to like flip them off or run them down, I just want you to, in, in your car to yourself, go, <laughs> right? That, that's who you are and that's what you do. Now, on the other hand, there is the spirit of God. When we put our faith in God, God gives us this spirit, which is hard to describe, but 
But just like you have a spirit inside of you, God takes the spirit that's inside of him and he puts it in us. And this spirit, the word for it, is pneuma. Just a very, very simple word that means breath. Holy breath, God's breath. This goes all the way back to the garden of Adam and Eve. And and when God formed Adam out of the dirt, he breathed life into him. The spirit that God gives us is his breath, and it is completely polar opposite from the Sarks. It is completely opposite. They, they are going in opposite directions at all times. They don't like get together for a Pro Bowl day or something like that. They, they are moving in opposite directions. And if you want to make a change that God has called you to make, the real change, bigger, bigger than going to church, bigger than reading your Bible, be, bigger than being a nice person, the change that God wants to see in your life is that you would no longer follow the desires, the self-gratifying, sinful nature, but that you would follow his spirit. And his spirit is always focused on one thing. Just like this is focused on self-gratification, his spirit is always leading you to and guiding you to bringing glory to God. That's its one-line mission statement. God is always leading you to bringing glory to to God, and it is so different than the sinful nature. Now, keep on reading. It says, verse 6, the mind governed by the flesh, sinful nature, sarks, is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so? Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot, cannot please God. And this is something we keep trying to describe over and over and over again. It's like, hey, you know, you got to do this and you got to do this, but, but, but you cannot do it in the realm of the flesh. You have to be following after the spirit of God. Now, I want to take a time out, kind of a pause, because if you're a little bit more of a skeptical person, kind of like I am, you might be looking at that going, well, yeah, Grant, I get what you're saying. You're, you're, you're kind of using different language to describe natural instinct versus intelligence, right? So when somebody brings a box of donuts into the office and, and you see that box of donuts and you look at it and, and your, your natural instinct is to eat all of the donuts, okay? I, I don't struggle with this, but some of you fat people do. So anyway... You want to eat all of those donuts, right? You want to do that. But then there's intelligence that kicks in and says, no, 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 no. You shouldn't eat the donuts. You're actually going to be happier. You're going to be healthier. You're going to live longer if you don't eat the donuts. So intelligent kicks in and you say, no, I'm not going to do that. I want to be clear about something. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about natural instinct versus intelligence. Just because I refer to the sinful nature of the Sarks as, uh, as a pig, don't misunderstand me. It's actually very, very intelligent, and actually so are pigs. It's, it's very smart. In fact, it can be very complex. It can be super cunning and crafty. Just for example, like if you were ever a toddler, and you were, uh, when you go into a toddler room like we have over here in Upstreet, and you walk in there and, and all the kids are playing, and you see all the toys, and then you decide when you were a toddler there's that one toy that you wanted, what did you do? What did your sinful nature, and yes, to toddlers have sinful nature, way bad. So anyway, what do you do when you want that toy? You go and you seize the toy, you grab it, and if somebody tries to take it away from you, you jerk it back from them and you say what? Mine! That's what you say. And if, if you were an aggressive person, you, uh, when they tried to come back for it, you bit them if they tried to do it. You know, that's, that's what we do. As you grew up, you learned. You grew with intelligence. You began to understand that actually it works out better to your advantage to learn this thing of a fair and balanced system where everybody gets to share. That doesn't mean that you've got the Spirit of God and that you're following after the Spirit of God. It just means that your sinful nature has gotten smarter. It's gotten wiser. It's gotten better. And you've realized if you want your 15 minutes with the toy... It's better to go ahead and just follow this system of, share, of sharing, being fair, right? We, we learn that somewhere along the lines. And today, we grow up, and we're people that sometimes are convinced that, 
that we're pretty good folks. But really, end of the day, and this is, this is kind of deep, this really exposes our heart. Really, it's just our sinful nature being really smart. Even some of the most selfless acts that we do, what do they do? They end up in a payoff for us. At the end of the day, we're still just trying to gratify ourselves. One example, and I could point out a lot of examples, but, but one is when I, when I was a young pastor, I assumed that everybody that was in a charity work, nonprofit, people that served downtown in the homeless mission in Tulsa where I was first a minister, I, I assumed that those people down there, those, those were the most selfless people on earth. And I, and I want to give a blanket statement because so many of those people are really genuinely selfish people, or selfless people. But then I figured out that actually even those folks, even those folks are at the same time, many times, the selfless act ends up as a reward for them. They go down there and they serve and they let everybody know about it. And a lot of times what they've found is they've found a little platform where they can be in control. Or they've found a little platform, and maybe it's not the CEO of a company or anything like that, but they've found a little platform where they can get praise. The deepest this goes is when I think it when it comes to pastors. I always assume that pastors were just the closest people to God until I became one. And when I looked at pastors and got to know so many pastors, I began to see myself being a pastor and looking at I realized that even as a pastor, so many times people are doing it, not, not because they're completely selfless and not because we always want to follow the Spirit of God, but many times it's that sarks, that sinful nature that rises up inside of us and really we just want to be, we just want to be that, that, in that position. We want to have that position or we want to be thought of well by people. So many pastors have, have codependency issues and it has nothing to do with the Spirit of God. It's just us trying to gratify these appetites and these desires that we have built deep within ourselves. So just to make a point, I'm not talking about natural instinct versus intelligence. I'm talking about polar opposites, self-gratifying and pleasing God. And sometimes you can do the right thing, but you can do it for the wrong reasons. Sometimes you can follow after God or at least look like you're following after God, but at the end of the day, it pays off for you. And he is saying, that's, that's not it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who genuinely has the spirit of God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if Always want to catch a well-placed if. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And here's the thing. There is no way to tell from the outside looking in, for me to look at you and go, I know whether or not the Spirit of God lives in you. You can tell from your perspective, but there's no way that I can come. There's no stick that you can pee on, and we can prove that you have the Spirit of God. If there was, I would market it, right? You want to volunteer? Great. Go in the bathroom and... And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. That's a big statement. That's a heavy statement. That's, that's him saying, listen, this is, this is so real. This isn't about your actions outwardly. This has nothing to do with outward. This is all about the Spirit of God working inside of you. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, let me explain that, the reason we die isn't because of cancer. The reason that we die isn't because we don't eat healthy and don't go to the gym and don't run, thank goodness. We might die earlier because of that stuff, but we, that's not the reason we die. The reason we die is because in the Garden of Ad Eden, Adam and Eve disobeyed God and the punishment was death. They would have lived forever, we would have lived forever, but God knew this about us and it was proved in the very first few chapters of the Bible, it was proved that we will be disobedient to God and God's discipline, his punishment for that is death. The reason we die is because of sin, because of our separation from God. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. It's the opposite of sin, it's goodness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit, his pneuma, his breath that lives in you. Therefore, he says, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Let me, let me take a time out on that phrase, led by the Spirit. A lot of times we kind of misunderstand that phrase. And, and it's not that this is bad, but when we talk about being led by the Spirit, if you've heard anybody say, I was led by the Spirit, it's usually kind of like a, a particular experience they had. Like, like somebody will say, yeah, just, just one day I woke up, man, and I just felt like God was like leading me to buy Cheetos at Walmart. So like I bought some Cheetos at Walmart, and, and while I was there, I met this guy, and I led him to Jesus. You know what I mean? There's just this, this experience that they have, and that's what people are talking about when they say led by the Spirit. That's not what he's saying here. That's a thing. But that's not what he's saying here. He's talking about much more our carnal, our sinful nature, our, our self-gratifying desires versus following the Spirit of God. So that would be more like this. When I, was, uh, when I was young and hungry, and I'd just gotten married, and we had a baby, and my check was all we had. I worked at this place, and, and we just had just enough. I mean, just enough. We would go to the grocery store and be like, okay, we're going to get food for a week for the three of us with diapers and everything for like 60 bucks. Like, we're going to make it happen. So we had just enough. I had to walk to work sometimes because we didn't have gas to, for me to get to work. So, and it was a long ways. It wasn't like a little thing. Anyway, so we would... We, would, uh, we, we were just meeting it. And one day I walked in and they gave me my check. I was supposed to get a $125 check after all the taxes had been taken out. And she gave me a check for like $375. And I put it and I looked at it and I was like, <sighs> and I stuck it back in my pocket and I walked away and I was thinking they must see what great work I'm doing around here. And then they're just giving me a little surprise, right? And my sinful nature said, just walk away and take the money. And then the Spirit of God was in me. And like, well, if you really think they gave you a bonus, they think you're doing a good job, you should go in there and tell them thank you. And my sinful nature said, no, just walk away. Take the money and run. Ooh, you know, take the... So I'm walking, and I am wrestling, and this part is going back and forth in me, and I knew absolutely, immediately, I knew absolutely what I needed to do. I need to walk in. So I walked back in there, and I said, hey, I think you might have paid me too much. And she was like, that's impossible. I don't make mistakes. I almost grabbed it back and, <laughs> all right, if you don't make mistakes. I said, no, I, I think you gave me like two paychecks or three, I don't know. But, uh, and so I gave it back to her and she's like, oh, that's, that is wrong. So she typed up a new check and gave it to me for $125. And she said, thanks. And I walked away. I was like, thanks. That's all I'm going to get is thanks. Not here's a little extra for your trouble or thanks for being honest or anything. It's just thanks. So I walk away, and this isn't one of those stories where then I got home and there was a big check in the mail. Or I just walked away and didn't have that money. That's what it means by led by the Spirit. There is your self-gratifying sinful nature that only cares about itself, and there is the Spirit of God that only cares about bringing glory to God. And that's what he means by led by the Spirit. He says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You can't disassociate those two. They are branded together. Verse 15, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. He's saying, hey, this the sinful nature, it, it gratifies the flesh, but you, don't, you miss out on this, that you, you, by the Spirit, if you follow the Spirit, you are a child of God. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This is a non-negotiable. 
when it comes to following God. I try to describe this in so many different ways. I try to say, hey, if you're going to follow God, it's, it's really not by the outward stuff. It's not by just going to church. It's not by checking any kind of box. It's, it's not by fulfilling any kind of sacrament. Um, you, it's not because you take communion. It's not because you get baptized. It's because you don't follow the sinful nature and you follow the Spirit of God. And here's what God wants us to do. God wants us to put to death the sinful nature. God wants us to kill the pig, right? Now, I've had the opportunity to kill a pig. And, uh, and every time uh, that I've, I've done that, there's, uh, there's pure joy because I hate pigs. I think I mentioned that before. Every time I eat a piece of bacon, it's just a beautiful reminder <laughs> that there is one less pig on God's green earth. We can... <laughs> That's why there's no vegetarian farmers, okay? So <laughs> I'll eat that pig. Anyway, so we kill the pig. You need, first, you've got to learn to hate the pig, but, but you've got to learn to kill it and follow after the Spirit of God. Now, this actually isn't a very complicated process, but I've decided to complicate it by adding some three points so we can try to figure it out. So kill the pig. The first thing is recognize the difference. Recognize the difference between the pig and the pneuma. Recognize the difference between the sarks and the spirit of God. It really isn't very difficult to recognize the difference, but, but that's the first step. If you want to get complicated and you want to break it down, it's just to go, let's recognize the difference. And really, it's just not that complicated to figure out. Like, you know. Let's go through a scenario here. I just want you to imagine that you're the place where you work, don't know where you work, but the place where you work, all of a sudden you find out that somebody at that place of employment is talking trash about you behind your back, right? Never happened to anybody, I know, but that sometimes happens. You find out that, that person is talking trash, and just, just for a minute, kind of breathe in the emotion that that brings up in you, Right? And then on top of that, I want you to find out, and this person has been like undermining you to your boss, and it's like putting your job in jeopardy. Now, on top of that, on top of that, you find out that this person is the person that you like the least. We don't say hate here, but we, this is the person that you like the least. So figure out that person at work that you like the least. I know everybody has one, right? I work at a church. I've got one. So anyway, we... <laughs> it's totally Libby. Anyway, so we... Just imagine who that person is that you, you like the least, and now all of a sudden that person that just grinds, drives you crazy, you find out that they've been talking about you and undermining you and putting your job in jeopardy. Now, just for a moment, just take a pause. What do you do? Now, you can feel it, can't you? You can feel the sarks screaming, and you can feel the pneuma of God, and it's telling you two completely different things, and you're torn, and you've spent your whole life doing what the pig tells you to do. So it's really hard to transition and do what the Spirit of God wants you to do, but you can feel it. For some of you in here, it might be different. For some of you in here, you know exactly what you're going to do. Maybe it's a small crowd, but you, you know this, that it's somebody, you're going to meet that person in the parking lot, right? Or, or maybe you're thinking, maybe a bigger crowd of you are like, well, I'm going to give them a taste of their own medicine. I'm going to let them know how that feels, right? Some of you, you might not do that. Some of you might be sitting there going, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do nothing. Because that person is just a big piece of poop, right? And they don't deserve a response from me. And all of those, one of them sounds right, but all of those, it's just a pig. It's just the sinful nature filling you with bitterness, hate, anger towards the person. And if you listen, it's not even that complicated. You can hear the Spirit of God, and what's the Spirit of God saying? Buy them coffee. Bake them a pie. Take them out for lunch. Kill them with kindness, right? You can hear the Spirit of God doing that, but because you've lived for so long down here, you're going, I ain't doing that. Only crazy people would do that. And God's going, yeah, let's get crazy. Let's get a little nuts. Do something that not everybody else is doing. And I promise you will find what it said at the top of the text. You will find life and you will find peace. Second one, recognize the difference. Again, this isn't very complicated, but I want to complicate it a little bit. Win, win the mind game. Every battle that you've ever like won or lost in your head has been won or lost right up here. 
When it comes to, to lust or adultery or any kind of sexual desires we have, that, that is won or lost in our mind. But we have a tendency to dabble in the sinful nature. We have a tendency to flirt with the sinful nature. And because we focus our minds on the wrong thing, and, and we think, well, nobody really sees my thought life. It really comes to my actions. And the Spirit of God's like tapping us on the shoulder going, actually, no. No, I care very much about the things that you think, the things that you dwell on, the things that you fester on, the things that you consume you. You've got to not just, not just with your outward actions, but you have got to put to death the sinful nature and focus on the things of God. Can you imagine the things that God could do with you if you stopped thinking about the things that your self-gratifying nature wants you to think about and you started thinking about the things that he wants you to think about, things that he wants you to dwell on, things that he wants you to focus on, about bringing him glory, serving him, serving the people around you, you would be completely new people because up here, you're already following the Spirit of God. And then third, again, not complicated, but... Follow the Spirit. If you want to kill the pig, follow the Spirit. You've, you've heard the old saying, probably, if you have two dogs, which dog's going to get stronger? The one you feed. If you will follow the Spirit of God, that sinful nature is going to get farther and farther away, and it's going to squeal at you less and less. Follow the Spirit. When I was uh, in college, I, I drove truck for a band called Impact Brass. Now, I want to be clear about that. I wasn't a musician. I didn't sing. I drove the truck. I had a really simple job. There was about 19 musicians and roadies and stuff that would travel in this big charter bus, and I would drive behind with all the equipment. So they were all up in this bus, and I had this, like, one-ton dually with a 25-foot trailer and a gooseneck, and I would just follow the bus. That was my entire job. We traveled all over the country as far like southeast as Florida and far northwest as Oregon and, and everywhere in between. And my only job was to follow the bus. I, didn't, I wasn't even allowed to unload the equipment when we got there. I just literally just followed the bus. I drove this truck and followed the bus. Well, because that, it was fun, I had a lot of good experiences, but it's kind of a numb, numbing thing, mind-numbing job. Right? So I'm just, I just follow the bus. and So I'm not even really you know, doing my job really well all the time. And one day we were in the middle of West Texas. And I'm just driving down the road. My mind's in la-la land. It's amazing that we didn't all die. But we were just driving down the road. And I looked up and realized I was following an RV. <laughs> and I looked at it and I was like, that's weird. And I like passed the RV thinking, well, the bus must be in front of it. And Nothing. If you've ever been out in West Texas, you can see for a long, long ways, long and flat, there was no vehicle out in front of me at all, and I realized it wasn't there. Now, we didn't have cell phones, and our CBs uh, didn't always work, so I tried to get him on the CB. Nothing happened, and I'm just out there driving around. I'm like, oh, no, where am I? So I pull over, and I get out a map, and I realized about an hour previous to that, I had taken an exit that I shouldn't have taken, and I'd been following an RV for like an hour. So what do you do when that happens, right? My only job still is to follow the bus. I got to figure out where that bus is, and I got to get behind it, right? So I get out my map, and I'm trying to figure out, of course, no GPS or anything. I get out my map, and I'm like, well, I think, luckily, I remembered where we were going, right? We were on our way somewhere, and I'm like, that means they've got to be on this interstate, because there's like three roads out here, and they got to be on this one. So I, I drove as fast as I can. I'm flying down the, the road 90 miles an hour, and I'm just trying to try to get ahead, and I finally, I finally find where they're at, and I hear them on the radio. I hear the voice on the radio of the, of the guy in the bus, and I, I realized where he was at, and I got back behind him following the bus. To, today, it's really, it's really that simple. Follow the Spirit. And if today you're sitting listening and going, man, there's a lot of times I haven't been following the Spirit. I've been, I've been letting the self-gratifying sinful nature rule my life. It's as simple as this. Just, just find where God's at and follow him. And a lot of times those are the really simple things. It might be a big thing. It might be a really big complex thing that you've been putting off or you've been avoiding or it might be getting married to the girl you're living with or it might be <laughs> dumping the girl you're living with, right? Probably needs to happen. Anyway, so you're, you're trying to figure, it might be a big life-changing thing, but follow the Spirit. 
It might be something very simple where you just need to go home and have a conversation with your wife. You need to have a conversation with a friend. You need to forgive somebody. You just need to change an attitude or a, a something in your heart. It might be something as simple as that, but until you follow the Spirit, until you start taking those little steps, you're never going to be following behind Him. Just follow the Spirit. Let me pray for you.